this week on the Back Table Podcast. Trajectory planning doesn't really work here, right? Sometimes the angles that we choose, the machine will just tell you, not achievable, can't do it. And you still can access, which we did under fluoroscopic guidance, and you still could visualize it with cone beam CT. But we did have to utilize those things we talked about before where we said, we're almost in the right place, but I just have to use tactile feel to move myself five millimeters, more caudal and more medial, and then we're perfect, right? And nobody wants to hear that you were okay, you know, not terrible. So we were really happy to be perfect after using that combination of knowledge and and tactile feel. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Stryker's interventional spine business offers the control you need, the flexibility you want, and the quality your patients deserve. Stryker is your partner in making healthcare better. From technology to training, from reimbursement tools to patient education, Stryker is there to support you every step of the way. Innovation is the driving force at Stryker. Their extensive product portfolio for vertebral augmentation and radiofrequency ablation procedures ensures that you have the tools needed to provide top-notch care. But their commitment to advancement doesn't stop there. With recent additions like the Optablate Bone Tumor Ablation System and FDA 510K clearance for the spine jack system for compression fractures that result from malignant lesions, myeloma, or osteolytic metastasis, you'll be eager to explore all the solutions Stryker has to offer. Learn more at www.strikerivs.com. Now, back to the show. This is your host, Jacob Fleming, and today it's a pleasure to have on the show Dr. Dana Dunleavy, interventional radiologist, and it's not your first time on the show. Uh, Most recently, you did an excellent interview with Wayne Olin. So I want to officially welcome you to the Backtable team and welcome you as my guest tonight. Thanks for your time, Dana. Thank you, Jacob. A great honor to be here. Well, it's it's a lot of fun to have you and talk about these topics. I know we both share a lot of passion about. You've devoted your career toward pushing forward interventional spine and particularly in the oncologic area. And that's really our focus for today. We're going to talk about bone tumor ablation and as well how to incorporate vertebral augmentation techniques from vertebroplasty to mechanical augmentation, such as with the spine jack device. So this is an area where there's a lot of growth. We're seeing evolution almost constantly in terms of the techniques that are available. But before we dive in, just tell our guests or our listeners a little bit about your background and training. Thank you. You know, one of the things that sometimes comes up is is just how odd I am. And, you know, growing up in a, a small country town, my mom was a midwife and continues to be a midwife. And my dad, a contractor, and had a nice balance of being involved in healthcare and also getting some of that hands-on experience. And I also had opportunities in this kind of hippie town to work on a biodynamic farm, drive tractors, do a lot of gardening and really allowed me to come to a good place in where I should be in medicine. Combination again of, you know, growing up, delivering babies in our house, in other mothers' houses, and then, you know, realizing through my athletic career that I wanted to do something in the musculoskeletal system. So I went to something called the Waldorf School, you know, where they focus on things like movement and music and language before you get into other things like mathematics and science. And then in high school, I went to Ski Academy. And the joke is we didn't learn a whole lot, but we did develop and and learn how to succeed in anything we did. So after that, I went to college at Middlebury and was on the Division One ski team where that's when education began. And I think that's the opportunity for all these people who take a a different path is really finding their passion and understanding how to succeed. After that, ended up at Johns Hopkins for both residency and fellowship. And I guess I should just take one step back in that, you know, many people in this area, like yourself and like myself and Tony Brown and Jack Jennings and Doug Beal and many others, you know, really 
had a tough time deciding between orthopedics, neurosurgery, and interventional radiology. And I think that we've all found our perfect place in really not only combining those fields, but working very collaboratively with those specialists. So I was unofficially accepted into orthopedic residency as a medical student before applications began. And in spending a lot of time doing acting internships, you know, with orthopedics and and radiology, found some amazing mentors and really that pulled me into interventional radiology. Fantastic. And you alluded to in your prior discussion with Dr. Olin, you did seek some training outside of your formal residency and fellowship training in order to focus into the spine. And so tell us, how have you gone about that? And then leading into the next question about your current practice, specifically the vertebral augmentation and tumor ablation practice, how you kind of got to there, knowing that it took a lot of extracurricular effort, given the lack of sort of, you know, this, this stuff has been unfolding over the course of your career the formal training pathway is still not yet defined for this weird kind of hybrid that we strive to do. Very true. You know, when I was a medical student and I was accepted into Johns Hopkins, basically everyone said you have to go there. And it was based on, you know, this is the number one institution in the country and arguably in the world. And what an amazing experience it was doing a lot of interventional oncology and seeing people that travel from all over the world for complex things you normally wouldn't see at all in your career. However, to your point, the musculoskeletal aspect, doing vertebral augmentation or other areas of interventional pain treatments, I felt wasn't adequate for what I wanted. And the program was very supportive of allowing me to do some some externships, so to speak. And, you know, Wayne Olin, was only an hour away. And essentially, that's all he did was interventional spine all day, every day. And I immersed myself in it for a month. And it was incredible, you know, coming back and sharing that experience, giving giving talks to my co-residents and co-fellows. And I wasn't the only one. You know, there were other residents and fellows that, that left Hopkins and did similar things, including the program you're at now. Coming back and saying, hey, this is this is the future of what we need to be doing. And that was true. And, you know, in the process, I think I've also participated with all of our colleagues across the country to say that, you know, there is a role for how you can continue training after fellowship. And that might be with your colleagues in your same group. But you've seen, right, that many people either are in a small group, you know, they may be switching to an OBL or an ASC. They may have been in a program that was like mine, you know, really intricate and amazing on the interventional oncology side or the peripheral arterial disease side, but maybe not in this area. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity both to network the way that we are here, you know, with Backtable through, you know, the different pain councils. I shouldn't say just pain councils, but the CSCs. So we now have different focused councils within the Society of Interventional Radiology. I work particularly in the pain council but there are other councils that are very helpful. And then, you know, working with industry and with our colleagues. So I think that that is one opportunity we have to continue education. You know, I just had one of my peers out in uh, Bozeman say, you know, he's on year 26 of medical school and all he meant, right, is continuing education always. So I've really enjoyed the opportunity I've had to teach, you know, both interventional radiologists, interventional pain, PM&R, neurosurgery, orthopedics. And as, you know, Wayne mentioned in our last episode, I find that I learn even more than they do each of these opportunities. Yeah, the cross-pollination I think is really great. And as you know, that's what we're all about on Backtable is collaboration over competition and learning from each other to push forward what we can offer to the patients And of course, our focus today being on the oncology patient and specifically bone metastasis, essentially spine metastasis. This is just a a very intense focus for a lot of our colleagues and something where I'm really excited about what's come out in really just the last year. So tell us a little bit about your practice. How does the uh, bone tumor ablation fit into that 
as well as vertebral augmentation. What's been your opinion of what's been unfolding in the last couple of years? Sure. So, you know, again, with different mentors, including, you know, Sean Tutton, who, who I had the opportunity to work with a couple of days ago, you know, really had tremendous amount of opportunity to learn from these guys who are really pioneers. And I feel like now you and I are, are benefiting a lot from that and really taking the opportunity to improve quality and access to care across the country. But, you know, I think that there are still tremendous opportunities we have to share with our colleagues, you know, how simple, safe, efficacious radiofrequency ablation is of bone metastases and knowing all the different modalities, right? I think that we come out of training, for instance, really understanding what do you do with with liver disease? But then you come out and, and you say, well, how do I grow my practice in interventional oncology focused on the spine? And there seems to be this big gap. The number one most helpful thing is being a helpful part of the team and, and by doing that, providing great quality biopsies, right? And if we are capable of being present at tumor board, again, that's not just academic centers, it's private groups, that's office-based settings. I mentioned a lot that COVID-1 positive was that almost every tumor board is available remotely now. And even, you know, a small town office space guy like me participates in several tumor boards from multiple networks every week. And always people are bringing up, hey, there's this T5 little thing that lights up on PET. Patient had breast cancer five years ago. I wish there was some way we could figure out what this is. And it's always short. That's really simple, really easy. And if we can be a helpful part of the team and make the diagnosis, we also have that same ability to treat it. And I think then the question is, can you do it safely? And to your point about all of the increasing data, I thought one of the interesting studies that a lot of our colleagues haven't read is one of the publications by Jack Jennings where he showed cryoablation, microwave ablation, and radiofrequency ablation. And intentionally in this model, made ablation zones that were far too large. And the nice thing about that was to show that even using those inappropriate temperatures and times still maintained a safe ablation within the spine because of that impedance in the cortex, but resulted in neuropathy and paralysis using cryoablation and microwave ablation. So it's just, you know, helpful for us to really understand how this can very safely and quickly be performed if you understand each of the technologies. And to your point again about, you know, some of the developments in technology, I think it's good for us to have access and hands-on to all the devices, right? And there's no reason that anyone should be locked in to a single device. So for instance, if we just go through radiofrequency ablation, right? Merit's had a wonderful device. Medtronic's had a wonderful device. Strikers had a wonderful device. All of them are really great in the right hands and the right experience, and each of them have their different advantages. And, and it's interesting, right, that you go to different regions and people think that there is only one device and they've never heard of the others. And so I just think it's very important that we share with each other all of the different techniques you have. So to just go back to, to what you're asking, I think the data continues to grow. Unfortunately, many of our trials are very small, and I think still when I present with radiation oncology, they will always win if we fall back on who has better data, who has more data, right? If we look at their trials with 20,000 patients and our trials with 200, it's a little challenging. You know, it's the same challenge we have with PAE, right? And, and we say TERP versus PAE. I mean, I think we have wonderful data but it's still not as in-depth uh, that TERP is. So do you want to move on to uh, some of the mechanical augmentation too? Yes, absolutely. So the next question that I'd like to talk about is you mentioned the tumor boards and, and how these referrals will come to you. Really can't overstate the importance of, of that approach because, you know, it talked with Majid Khan about this recently in our discussion that the days of being just sent a patient, do this, it's over. <laughs> and, and I would say for better or worse, but I think that's definitely for better. 
So you have to be involved from, from the very beginning with the biopsy and the, and the diagnosis. And so say you have a patient who comes up in tumor board and you feel can really benefit from what you can do in the interventional spine area. So tell us about pre-op imaging and what kind of considerations you're having with patient selection when we're talking about bone tumor ablation. And then to your point about uh, mechanical augmentation, when does that come in? Yeah, great. And just to start off, I mean, Majid Khan is an amazing pioneer as well. And I've learned a tremendous amount from him. And one of the ways you, you learn that you're impactful is when you move away from an institution and they force you to come back. So that's been great for him. And I, I love the type of research he does because he questions everything. You know, even our really great outcomes and great publications, he questions. And I think we're, we're looking at some of that to make sure that everything is, is what we think it is and that we're doing the best we can. As, you know, one of the recent back tables, we discussed that we all went into medicine to relieve suffering. So we want to make sure we're doing the best. In terms of the, the pre-op imaging, you know, I think this goes back even to doing good biopsies, right? And when we are participating in those biopsies, I always do a consult with those. It doesn't have to be that it takes all day, but it's the fact that we met the patient and we discussed why we're doing this biopsy, the risks and benefits of it, and why are we doing it? Because this might be a neoplasm. And if it is, what do we do next steps? And in that process, Every single patient, when they go back to their oncologist and discuss that this is a metastatic breast lesion, prostate lesion, myeloma, plasmacytoma, they always ask to come back and have that simple treatment where it was like a biopsy, but they put a probe in it and they made it go away. And so I think, you know, number one is just doing a simple face-to-face -face contact. And the imaging part, you know, maybe we get into NCCN guidelines a little bit. I think it's very important for us to know that MRI is the gold standard for looking at metastatic lesions of the spine. And oftentimes people think it's PET, right? And PET is the way to go if you're an oncologist and you're looking to stage, but it's not as sensitive for looking at the spine. And then you obviously have the high resolution of CT. And so if we look at some institutions, they do all three of those. I'll just tell you my personal opinion is if it's convincing enough on any, well, I shouldn't say on CT alone, but on MRI or on PET, then we will go ahead and treat because we do know that patients do much better with early intervention. And especially with these posterior vertebral body lesions that are at the pedicle body junction or close to the basal vertebral nerve and plexus, those lesions are soon in the epidural space and, and we're talking about changes in Bilski score. So we try to intervene immediately if we know we need to. However, so say the patient is referred to me with a PET scan, they ask me to do a T12 ablation, we will still get an MRI, but it will be after our treatment. And part of the reason for that is because we know that we're missing some of the lesions on PET. And we may also be missing some other aspects, right? Some pedicle involvement. However, nothing is going to change for that vertebral body that we were referred. And so we are not going to, you know, make people go through a checklist of 12 things while they continue to get worse because we certainly see that frequently that patients that have a delay in intervention end up in the hospital, either with pneumonia, DVT, PE, constipation, anorexia, a bunch of issues that are just seems so simple, but, you know, similar to vertebral augmentation data, you know, with osteoporotic fractures, but much worse, you know, in the malignant category. Absolutely. And at the risk of asking a question that seems kind of simple or obvious, maybe, there are some people who treat spinal metastases uh, with a pathologic fracture with vertebroplasty alone. It's something that's been done and is done to this day. Talk about the rationale for bone tumor ablation prior to augmentation? Sure. To, to keep it as simple as possible, I think that the way that Tony Brown, who's described this really well, says is if you have an osteoporotic or traumatic fracture, we're talking about mechanical pain, and that does very well with vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. And we can stabilize that instability, and patients do very well. When we think about 
malignant lesions, we're talking about several different types of pain, right? We're talking about stretching of the cortex, right? One of the things that you often see on a spine MRI, the first thing that jumps out, right, is this posterior bulging. You see the posterior wall just bulging into the spinal canal. And, and that has a stretching type of pain. And then you have the lytic aspects, right, where you're destroying the nerve and the bony trabecula. And then you have also the involvement of either the exiting nerves or the traversing nerves. And so you have multiple sources of pain that are not cured or fixed with mechanical stability. And so, again, just keeping it as simple as possible, mechanical instability works well with vertebral augmentation, but patients will certainly still have pain if you just do vertebral augmentation alone for these malignant lesions. And so I think that that gets us to something that people oftentimes, the, the real underlying reason that people will defend why they do vertebral plasty alone. And the reason is that if they're old enough and they haven't used these newer technologies, doing ablation takes a really long time. And they've probably seen some bad outcomes from that. We do know, right, that if you're on the table prone and sedated for hours, very likely to have some post-procedure shoulder pain, pneumonia, various other issues that may develop. But as these technologies have continued to get better, ablation doesn't take that long. And so I don't describe that as a dramatic benefit because we're going to make more money or because we can turn over patients or rooms faster. It's because it's safer, right? And that it's very hard to find a reason that you shouldn't be doing radiofrequency ablation as part of your vertebral augmentation for patients with pathologic fractures because it's so safe and efficacious now. Absolutely agree. And just since you referred to it, what is the burn time like nowadays for most of these lesions? Yeah. So if we, you know, look at one of the devices that people are oftentimes using, you're talking about nine minutes as the most common ablation time. And that ablation is designed to treat the entire vertebral body. And so I think that eventually will get us into a different discussion of, do we need to treat the entire vertebral body? I think that on the one hand, people would say yes, because we know that we safely can, and it doesn't take that long. However, I would say that you're smarter than that. And if you go into a kidney or a lung or a liver, you wouldn't just max out based on some algorithm that has nothing to do with the tumor size. You'd actually think about it and use a lesion guide or a cookbook or whichever term you want to use. And I still think that that's appropriate, right? Let's be at least slightly intellectual enough to think about what the pre-procedure imaging looks like and plan our ablation. And so some of these devices, right, they have measuring drills. They'll tell you which probe you should use, tell you which ablation time you should use. But I hope that we're all capable of looking at the PET or the MRI and knowing that in advance. Absolutely. And that, that brings to mind an additional consideration is that all vertebral bodies are not the same. And especially in the case of oncology patients, we often see very collapsed vertebra with these pathologic fractures, extreme osteolysis, just really changing the anatomy and the volume. And so it would stand to reason that the volume that you need to treat is, is probably different because we don't necessarily want to be ablating the adjacent discs if we can avoid it. And so one of these situations that I think I'm most excited about is that prior to a few years ago, in the U.S. at least, we didn't really have good options for these patients who had a, a lytic tumor with a pathologic fracture. Or not necessarily even a lytic tumor, but just a pathologic fracture with a lot of height loss. And to my knowledge, uh, the, the only solution in that context that's available for us right now is the spine jack, a mechanical augmentation device for restoring height. And I think it was about within the last year, maybe, that the spine jack actually got FDA approval in addition to its prior indications of osteoporotic and traumatic compression fractures, but specifically 510K approval for the indication of pathologic neoplastic fractures. And so using bone tumor ablation system, for the reasons you said, taking care of those different elements of pain, and of course, the local control of the tumor is a major concern, especially for patients with oligometastatic disease. But up until recently, at least in the U.S., like I said, we didn't really have a good option for 
vertebral body reconstruction, so to speak. And I've seen some extremely impressive work from you, from others. I saw a case from Chicago the other day that was just immaculately recreated the vertebral body with probably 80 to 90% uh, of its original height from a, a practically a, a plana configuration. So the stuff that we can do now is a lot more advanced than it was a few years ago. And so tell us about integrating the two techniques of bone tumor ablation and mechanical augmentation. Where does it fit in? You know, certainly mechanical augmentation is not something that needs to be done on every patient and has economic costs associated with it. Just tell us about how those two technologies come together for you. What are those situations? Yeah. And just to start off with the first thing you you mentioned in terms of we don't want to ablate things we shouldn't, you know, I think there's been some great work in the Southeast by, you know, Jason Levy, Dave Prologo, Neil Resnick, and some of their studies, right, showing even more complicated things in the spine, right? You know, treating these lytic metastases in the acetabulum, you know, a bunch of different interesting techniques for that, but also showing you the risk, for instance, if you do cryoablation in that area and you're not careful about what your ablation zone is, that will go right across the hip and you can induce a fracture of the femoral head. So it is important that we know our anatomy and that we understand our technologies. And again, I think that we should all appreciate the great data and publications that some of these guys are really spending a lot of time on because I was once told, hey, Danny, you need to make mistakes because that's the only way to learn. And I said, I don't accept that. You know, I will learn from the mistakes other people have made and I won't make them. And I think we have the opportunity to do that because of these really courageous people that have shown, you know, what happens with their own experience early on. To get to your point of, you know, really severe pathologic lesions with oligometastatic disease, one of the biggest concerns we have, right, is cement extravasation. And, you know, what better way to address it than by putting a construct in? And so oftentimes the calls that I receive are, you know, I don't think I can treat this patient. I really want to, you know, neurosurgery is asking me for help. Radiation oncology is asking me for help. But look at this lesion, right? It's a huge lytic metastasis extends, you know, through the pedicle body junction. And I just don't want to harm the patient. And I think that that's a good start, right? Is that we want to make sure we're we're providing a great benefit and very minimal risk. And one of the ways we can do that again is by putting an implant in. And, you know, Tony Brown has done some amazing cases like this. And, and one of the phrases he's used as a jack corpectomy, right? So you're, you're putting a spine jack in and you're, you're honestly recreating a new vertebral body from something that's just a plana of mud right? There's, there's really no recognizable bony trabecula anymore. And the interesting thing with that is for many of us that reach out to our neurosurgical colleagues or orthopedic spine colleagues and say, hey, you know, this is a Bilski, you know, let's go with 1B. And do you want to treat this surgically, do a decompression, do a corpectomy, put a cage in here? The answer is almost always no right? They, they know that the morbidity is so high with doing those procedures that if we can provide any benefit of symptomatic pain relief, reduced opioid use, increased mobility, you know, functional improvement, and debulking of the tumor, then they want us to help. And so the way that I think we can succeed there is by going in, ablating as much as we can safely, And I don't think that that means you need to be unsafe and ablate into the spinal canal as an example, but then putting, you know, a structure in, right? And we oftentimes use this analogy, right? If you're going to build a skyscraper, you wouldn't just take your cement truck and start shooting cement into the dirt and hope that that's a great structure, right? You would have slabs and you would have rebar and you would make sure that it's exactly in the form that you want. And so, One of the great things about mechanical augmentation combined with ablation is that you're providing a structure after you do the tumor ablation. And so, again, I think the bone biopsy, if we say doing a bone biopsy is easy, right? And I think that we all can do that. And we could spend some time on some different techniques to make sure we get better sensitivity and specificity. But 
if we can do that, then we also can do radio frequency ablation. And the challenging part, right, is making sure that we provide the cement deposition in a location that is safe and efficacious and putting it through a construct makes it easy. And so that's, I think, the benefit right now. We're at a place where we can do ablation faster and we can also do the cement portion safer. And so one of the things that I show people is that if you really want to minimize your cement, you feel really uncomfortable about it, you can put about a cc of cement into each spine jack construct on each side. In general, depends obviously what the vertebral body and what the size of the spine jack and things like that looks like. But before, in most cases, it's going to extend out of that construct into your fracture cleft. And so if you're a true minimalist, you may decide that I'm at least going to fill these two vertical columns of strength and help them more than I would if I did nothing. Now, obviously in the program you're in, that's not enough, right? You're, you're then going to say, I know based on the data from Europe that the single most important thing I can do for better outcomes is to increase the cement that I put in. And if you're going to do that, right, then you can still visualize that. You can go side by side. You can use curved needles. There's a bunch of different techniques you can use to put cement into the more intact portion of the vertebral body or various other techniques to make sure you can safely do that. But certainly using mechanical augmentation makes it safer and easier. And I think that, you know, that gets us a little bit into why would anyone not do that? And one would be that you think that it takes a long time. And so sometimes I just spend a little bit of demonstration with people to show, right, you access one side, put the probe in, as that's going, you then put your second cannula down, start that probe. First one finishes, you pull the probe out, K-wire goes down, jack goes in, and then the second probe finishes, jack goes in. Now, the most challenging part of the case, which was the cement, becomes a lot safer. And you really didn't spend any more time because in the end, the hardest part becomes simple. So that's, to me, the most important part. Again, I think you, you talk to Wayne Olin, you say, the myeloma cases, even if he's not going to ablate, which he usually doesn't, he and I and, and many others would say that the plasma cytomas are the ones that we will ablate, but a general run-of-the-mill myeloma will just do vertebral augmentation. But using mechanical augmentation provides a lot of safety because many of those myeloma cases have some cortical destruction. You can't always see it because they're small, but they're very high risk for extravasation. And so doing anything you can to improve your cement containment is great. And the last thing I'll say, you know, going back to Majid Khan, he's working on some other techniques, you know, for malignant fractures and how to best treat them as well. Excellent. And thank you so much for kind of walking down how the procedure would go in terms of the uh, sequential burns and placing the spine jacks. One question that I had kind of came up, kind of took this for granted in our conversation, that the prototypical approach is a bilateral transpedicular approach, kind of run-of-the-mill vertebral augmentation approach. Of course, in the last few years, well, eh, more than the last few years, there's been work done by Doug Beal specifically about the alternate approaches, parapedicular and extrapedicular approaches. I'm starting to see these come out more in the interventional radiology community, which is great. So, you know, I've seen not necessarily an oncology case, but a uh, parapedicular unilateral spine jack placed, uh, which can be placed in the middle of the vertebral body. That's great for very frail patients and patients who, you know, you're trying to make the procedure as rapid as possible while still giving them that civil engineering of the spine correction that you're there to do. And so I'm wondering for any of the oncology cases, would you ever stray away from the bilateral transpedicular approach? For example, a focal uh, lesion or maybe a focal plasma cytoma would you ever stray away from that prototypical approach? Sure, great question. And you gave a lot of very helpful information even in that question. So that was, that was great. I think the best thing to overall take from that is transpedicular approach overall is the safest approach. And so for most interventional radiologists, interventional pain, PM&R, doing a transpedicular approach routinely is the way to go. And I also think that you can do almost anything from a transpedicular approach now with the devices that we have. 
And if we think about some of our mentors that you mentioned, they didn't have these devices. And so some of those approaches were necessary in order to achieve what they were able to achieve with straight systems and and with slow systems and things like that. And so I think it's very important to know the difference, you know, of transpedicular, paraparticular, extrapedicular, and, and why you might use each of those. But I think it's also helpful to know that our first choice should be transpedicular. And I also think that with mechanical augmentation, our first choice should be bipedicular. And no matter what, I don't think there's any orthopedist, you know, who focuses their career on biomechanics that would say that a unipedicular spine jack is as good as a bipedicular spine jack, right? I mean, you just have so much more opportunity for better distribution of force. You know, we think about the approach, use, again, using a transpedicular approach where those skis are ending anteriorly almost at midline, and as they come back, they're going lateral. And so with two sets of implants, you're really almost treating the entirety of the vertebral body with that surface area. Whereas unipedicular, you know, if you were to do a cone beam CT at the end, as an example, you'd see you really didn't have as much ability to expand the jack and cause end plate height restoration as you did otherwise. The other parts with that, there are certainly some examples where some of our colleagues do extrapedicular access and sometimes particularly with malignant lesions. And some of the reasons for that would be that they might want to place an implant that is too big for that pedicle. And the way to achieve the appropriate location within the vertebral body with a pedicle that's too small for, as an example, you know, a 5.8 spine jack, but you're putting it in a T8 vertebral body with a, you know, steep, narrow, angulated pedicle is to start with an extrapedicular approach. And there are certainly people that are doing it very effectively with the concept of, we have a huge lytic metastasis here and we need the most surface area we can. And something to think about on either severe avascular necrosis or a lytic lesion is that when you put your spine jack in, it's floating there, right? It's not stable until you're able to get good apposition of the superior and inferior skis. And obviously, if you have a longer surface area, you will reach that apposition sooner and safer. So there is some benefits to that. And in fairness too, larger implants have more force, right? So we talk about 500, 750, 1,000 newtons. And so sometimes if you're treating something that you believe needs more surface area and more force to create the best outcomes, then sometimes you are finding another reason why you might choose an extra particular approach. One of the things that people ask me, which is very simple, but I think helpful to know is how do you safely even do a high thoracic vertebral augmentation? And I think this goes to that concept too. And so one technique that some people use is to just make sure they safely go down on the pedicle, right? And they feel the pedicle and then they can actually take the interventional radiologist out of them and become a surgeon and just use tactile feel to walk their way lateral until they're walking their way off the side or lateral aspect of the pedicle and thereby know where they need to begin. Now, you don't want any of these cases, right, that we've heard of where people miss the vertebral body and either cause a huge hematoma or a pneumothorax. Sadly, the, those cases do exist. And so I think that you can very safely have the appropriate access just by using tactile feel. Absolutely. That's something that I've found I've been learning a lot about in the last few months, just doing a lot of vertebral augmentation cases and seeing a lot of thoracic cases, mostly in osteoporotic patients. And the approach really is quite different from the lumbar, and the difference becomes more pronounced as you go further up the thoracic spine. So the, the challenge is definitely there, and I found that having to develop more of my tactile sense about realizing, you know, initially we, we aim for relatively close to the spine, obviously to avoid a pneumothorax, but at the costotransverse, costovertebral junction, kind of where that's all coming together. But starting at the rib 
And knowing that you're safe and you're on bone, you know that you're not going to cause a pneumothorax and sort of walking towards that has been really helpful. The tactile sense, I really like what you said about taking the interventional radiologist out of it and channeling the inner surgeon. It actually, I, I, I really agree with that. And it does take me back to my general surgery days and in internship where, you know, we're not doing things as kind of precisely and image guided as we are with most of our procedures. And actually the resolution that you get from tactile sense in some ways is better than what you're seeing. That's definitely the case in these, these ones where anatomy is distorted, which is a lot of oncology cases. So sometimes you have to, this may sound like sacrilege for podcasts with a lot of IR listeners, but you got to turn that off for a second. Yeah. And, and for instance, I don't know if the biking analogy works for people, but if you go to Wayne's World, right, and, and she's waving high Wayne, and, and you tend to steer away, right? If you turn your head, you don't tend to go straight. The same is true when I watch people do uh, mechanical augmentation. If they are completely obsessed with looking at the monitor, even though they think they have a vertical orientation of the implant, they don't because, you know, their handle is moving while they're looking at the monitor. And so I think it, it's really helpful sometimes to just focus on the carpentry that you're doing and the artwork that you're doing and not always be looking away somewhere. There's, there's quite a few other examples, you know, we have with that, like, say, perforator ablation, you know, where sometimes you have to help people to not always look at the ultrasound, just look at the probe, right, and start to understand that you're nowhere near in the right place. So stop looking up there. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> that was something that I really experienced, uh, you know, uh, just to go on a quick tangent, but uh, something I wanted to share. When I was in residency, I learned vertebral augmentation strictly by the on fos oblique approach in the lumbar spine. And when I started fellowship, I was forced to very quickly acclimate to doing it on a straight AP approach, which I didn't have a whole lot of experience doing. And there is a lot of frustration when first learning that approach where you're kind of like, okay, why am I not going where I'm going? And, you know, multiple people that I've worked with have just uh, been very helpful in this. And one of the best pieces of advice I got is look down at your hands, look down at your hands and where you are on the patient's body, you know, and is your angle too steep? Are you too far off midline and forcing yourself to do that? And that, of course, that it's just like, well, duh. You know, but I had to do the same thing when I was learning ultrasound guided procedures before it becomes more of an intuitive kind of thing with the hand-eye coordination. Why is my needle not in plane? Why does it look down at your hands? <laughs> and, and often the, the answer is there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's one of our challenges as image guided surgeons, so to speak, is that we're, we're so facile with the image guidance that a lot of times just doing things as simple as possible and knowing that you don't, in certain instances, need to be having your eyes glued to the fluoro monitor. And that gets tricky too when we're talking about onc cases. And I'm sorry to beat the drum on this, but where the anatomy is just really distorted and there's often not a lot of good landmarks to go by. Would you speak quickly about your thoughts about using advanced systems such as cone beam CT with needle guidance navigation? your experience using that, how you think it fits in, and is it something that we should all be doing? And sorry to make this a multi-part question, but the danger of becoming reliant on these advanced techniques. Your thoughts? Yeah, I can see you, you're speaking from multiple mentors at the same time. And I love that because, you know, that is helpful for us to address why this is a uh, emotional question. So my feeling is that there is a benefit to having that technology. Now, you know, I was just talking with some neurosurgeons yesterday and, and within this big group, they have guys that use navigation every day and guys that never do. And the, the older guys that grew up without navigation existing say, you know, this is a handicap of the young guys that they're reliant on it, just as you said. However, I think it's really helpful to utilize it and then understand that anatomy and be able to pick and choose when you think it's appropriate or not. Certainly, it doesn't add something in every case. And so, as an example, you know, I think that as we have discussions about things like sacroiliac joint dysfunction and pain, 
and we read some of the literature that says that 40% of implants for sacroiliac joint fusion are in the wrong place, we say, wow, you know, maybe there is a benefit to having CT guidance or cone beam CT or trajectory planning or navigation because that's just not right, right? Now, we do know that some people with C-arms don't ever have a complication. So it certainly is not necessary in all cases. But as an example, you know, most of us are all trained to do most biopsies, especially bone biopsies and CT. I'll tell you that my belief is the hybrid is the best, right? That doing bone biopsies with a C-arm alone is quite challenging to know that you truly targeted it and promise to your medical oncologist or radiation oncologist that when you get a benign biopsy, that it's not a false negative. And so my technique is to do the access under fluoroscopy and then a cone beam CT, which proves my device is going right through the lesion. And I find that's good for me, good for the patient, good for the nurses. It makes all of these procedures really easy And, you know, the hardest part for the patient, right, is lying in these uncomfortable positions. So I think that that's a wonderful hybrid. The same is true for all of my bone tumor ablation cases, right, that I will access with the knowledge of where, what the anatomy is and where the lesion is under fluoroscopic guidance. And then I'll use cone beam as confirm confirmation. Now, some people take the next step, right? And patient walks into the room, gets on the table, they do cone beam CT, And then they use guidance software. That has a different name for each device, you know, each each system that we have. But for mine, it's called trajectory planning. And, you know, it means that for anyone that's never used it, you can scroll through your axial images as an example, pick your target, pick your access. You can have multiple different planes that you're using, right? So you don't have to access at the same craniocaudal plane. So to me, there's a big advantage of using trajectory planning over CT fluoroscopic guidance, where having a very caudal angulation through a T5 pedicle, much easier to do in an angio room or a fluoroscopy room than it is in CT. I've seen some of my friends under CT fluoroscopic guidance, you know, where they're accessing from the wrong side of the CT scanner because of that angulation. They just can't reach through the entire scanner. And remember that most of our high thoracics, right, the cannula handle is almost in the patient's hair. And so, you know, that's the right way to do it. And if you're not doing it that way, you know, you'll probably have some post-procedure paresthesia because you're too close to the neural foramen. So that's what I think is the ideal, is having kind of a combination for the difficult lesions. To some degree, I use that information for education and teaching so that people can take that combination of fluoroscopic cone beam CT trajectory planning views and utilize it on a C-arm because they can put that all in their mind. But that's, that's the balance, I think. Now, I'll tell you this morning, as an example, I was doing an ablation of the ilium, and it was a really tall patient, the room we're in. It's challenging to do cone beam CT when, you know, his arms and his head are all the way up as far as it goes. And we're still trying to do a cone beam and trajectory planning, you know, down essentially in his proximal thighs. And so it did combine all the things you're mentioning, right? That we had to say trajectory planning doesn't really work here, right? Sometimes the angles that we choose, the machine will just tell you not achievable, can't do it. And you still can access, which we did under fluoroscopic guidance, and you still could visualize it with cone beam CT. But we did have to utilize those things we talked about before where we said, we're almost in the right place, but I just have to use tactile feel to move myself five millimeters more caudal and more medial, and then we're perfect, right? And nobody wants to hear that you were okay, you know, not terrible. So we were really happy to be perfect after using that combination of knowledge and, and tactile feel. So... The, the short, again, I think is there's a combination. And in my practice, I find that using that combination keeps me out of CT. I continue to live in CT for lung, but everything bone, I think, is better under fluoroscopy with the ability to do cone beam.
Agreed. I think the there's a lot to the hybrid approach. Sometimes for some of these very complex cases, I could see the benefit of having a, a true CT angio system. But in most cases, that's probably like using a rocket launcher to hunt geese. So I agree that what can be done in a standard angio suite, or even nowadays, certain C arms have cone beam CT capability. So that starts to extend into even the OBL setting. It does. You know, the one thing I would just say to that is depends what type of anesthesia you're doing, right? And that I think that those C-arms with comb beam are getting better, but in general, they take a little bit longer. And a little bit longer means if the patient moves at all, it's no longer useful. So for those people working in ASCs, as an example, where patients under MAC, I think that works great for many of our patients. And I find Again, in my practice, you're oftentimes getting patients that neurosurgery and ortho and PM&R are sending to you because they have severe COPD and cardiomyopathy and various other issues that don't allow you to sedate or do anesthesia. And so if the patient's moving, it can be challenging to do one of these really slow speed cold beams. Yeah, that's really good information to consider. Something that we are kind of used to as interventional radiologists kind of whether the patient passes the sniff test in terms of you look at them and you say, can we do this under moderate? Can we do that? Or, or Mac. And sometimes you just know, yeah, it's going to be a general case. And it's very helpful to have that. And it's another reason why there's never going to be a point where all of these cases can be done in the OBL. There's always going to be a need for those higher levels of care and being able to do it either in the hospital or ASC setting. That is all I had, Dana. This has been an excellent conversation. I want to know any any final thoughts? Uh, I do want to hear more general thoughts, but any final thoughts on, on the topic of bone tumor ablation and mechanical augmentation? Overall, I just hope that people can see the passion that many of us across the country have because these patients come back, not only the patient, but their families, and really tell you this is the greatest thing you could ever do for a cancer patient. And I neglected to mention that when when I was in high school, my close friend's sister was diagnosed with leukemia. And at the time, I didn't know why. I guess I guess I must have at least have shared with her my passion for healthcare to some degree in that she told me she was counting on me to prevent this from happening to other children and that I would have a role in oncology. And I didn't really see how until I kind of ended up in this land. And with doing bone tumor ablation, again, you have patients that come in in a wheelchair and they walk out, you know, and they live a good life. I think this part won't be in video, but you can see here, you know, we're talking about New York Matters. And I think that this is one of many organizations, obviously I'm in New York, one of many organizations that's really focusing on preventing opioid overdoses and complications and hospitalizations related to narcotic use. And we have an amazing ability to help people that way. And I think that the best way we can do it to avoid systemic therapy and complications, right, is to be targeted. You know, one of the terms people use for bone tumor ablation is targeted radiofrequency ablation or TRFA. And I think that that's the whole life that you're living right now, right, is targeting things towards people's pain. And we didn't have enough time to talk about NCCN guidelines, but remember that every year, there's something new in NCCN focused on pain and that pain actually not only is important for people's quality of life, but actually has survival implications. And so there's more and more emphasis, not only on bone tumor ablation or not only on vertebral augmentation, but all of the things that you and others are doing, including, you know, dorsal column stimulation, nerve blocks, rhizotomies, pumps, there's just an enormous amount of opportunity for us to help. And I think that we call ourselves interventional oncologists. And I think that there's a big opportunity for us to include treating people's pain within that category of interventional oncology. And I guess the, the last piece of that would be some of the adjunctive things that I think that you've already included in, in this, these MSK discussions, but talking about sacroiliac dysfunction talking about painful diabetic neuropathy. Again, I think that's a huge one that we'll probably come back to because 
you know, many of our colleagues do a lot of arterial work, or maybe they do a lot of venous work. They're seeing patients with leg pain. And one of the common things that I hear from the vascular surgeons is it's really frustrating to revascularize someone's leg and you're really proud of your work and the patient's really disappointed because they still have leg pain. And so, again, if people haven't heard it, doing neuromodulation for painful diabetic neuropathy actually even has better outcomes than treating non-surgical pain, back pain, or failed spine surgery, back pain. So, you know, we're talking about really great outcomes and some of it that's really fascinating, you know, this is data that's been presented at the ADA and other types of societies unrelated to us, but is that you have improved innervation in the legs and the feet. So people that had paresthesias or numbness in their feet because of diabetic neuropathy improve their sensation within their feet and they improve their A1C. So I guess you can tell that I enjoy the world of changing people's lives through improved quality of life and improved, you know, functional abilities. And it all fits in this world that I think that we enjoy, right? It's very minimally invasive. It's image guided. It includes all the anatomy we enjoy. And it's still what we may say is, you know, an extension of orthopedics and neurosurgery. So a lot of opportunity. And I think we're, we're really learning now that the next frontier or steps that we're taking is, you know, how do we also help people with neuromodulation within the oncology world. And there's a lot of effort going into that. Absolutely. I'm really glad you brought that up. And that's something that I wanted to throw out there to our listeners. It's definitely, as you and I were talking about earlier, a discussion unto itself and a lot of exciting stuff happening there. I think a lot of potential for involvement, especially for interventional radiologists who are providing these ablative diagnostic capabilities to extend that into neuromodulation and targeted drug delivery. That's something that uh, we really want to discuss in the future and also just bring a general awareness of the capabilities of those techniques, like you were saying, you know, and painful diabetic neuropathy, definitely something we'll get back on very soon because this falls into the realm that interests people like you and I so much of situations that otherwise don't really have a very good solution. And I think we've really gotten to talk about that today. This has been a fantastic conversation. I want to thank you for your time and humoring my many tangents, but I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, Dana. I want to, again, show my appreciation for you taking your time to talk to us about this. And as always, I like to end by asking my guests about what on the horizon are you most excited about right now? We talked about a lot of things that are here and that are coming. What is something that you're really looking forward to being perhaps the next step uh, for us? whether with the oncology patients or something else? I'm excited about too many things, um, but to try to, to nail it quickly, I think right now we're working on three column support for reducing adjacent level fractures, trying to really identify what the best techniques are to reduce additional fractures. I'm excited about those two areas we touched on at the very end, neuromodulation for neuropathy and for cancer pain. I would say that that is the one that's really clinching it for me right now because those are really growing problems. And the final would be, you know, there's, there's several clinical trials being involved, you know, now including us as interventional radiologists for sacroiliac joint dysfunction. And as Wayne alluded to, when you start asking and examining for it, you'd be amazed how common it is. And I've been honored that the neurosurgery colleagues have, have supported me in that because, you know, it is one of those crossover areas that can be considered surgery or can be considered minimally invasive. And I think it, it really is incredible, you know, to help people again in a way where they said for 10 years, you know, I've had this pain that has limited me from doing the things I want to do. So we now have the ability to make this better and less invasive than ever. And that takes me to the last, last point that you said that, you know, we can't do all these things in the OBL. And I think that the OEIS has also demonstrated that as well, in that all of us that do work not only at hospitals, but either at OBL or ASC, and many of us have done most of it at the OBL, must start thinking that if we want to be comprehensive, it probably won't all be in an OBL and start thinking, um, you know, for the next 
three to five years, how we want to develop that. Excellent. Well, just a lot of great topics to think about and have you back on the show for in the near future. Well, Dr. Dunleavy, thank you again so much for your time and any closing thoughts? No, I really appreciate it, Jacob. You're amazing that you uh, put so much time into this as a fellow. It's really incredible. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Honestly, these conversations give me so much energy and really keep me going. And so I, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. And like I said, won't be long before we have you back on. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvie Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Kennebrew. Thanks again and see you next time.